Um, so again, welcome everybody. This is another in our monthly events uh, where we actually have three this month, but different reality check guest speakers who come to share their wisdom from working as journalists in the industry. Today, we're delighted to have a former student of mine, not from William Patterson, but from St. John's University, who's gone on to do lots of great things, Anthony O'Reilly. He has worked for the Queen's Chronicle. Um, he worked for Muscle and Fitness. Um, he can tell us a little bit more about what he's doing now, and he still has uh, you know, a, a hand in journalism, but also maybe talk a little bit about how you can apply skills you learn in a journalism program to non-journalism jobs, because there's a lot of things you learn about critical thinking and writing and getting information that are useful for lots of different sorts of professions, right? Um, so we are very grateful that Anthony could join us today. Um, so to start out, Anthony, they did all submit questions in advance or certain questions have been submitted in advance. So I'll go to that and I'll maybe call on some different folks to introduce themselves as we go through and read their questions. But could you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Where'd you go to school? How did you first become interested in journalism? And we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to take part. Um, as Nick said, I am a former student of his from St. John's University. Uh, many fond memories of those classrooms. Uh, as you all know, Nick is a great professor, great teacher, and uh, was always a great journalist. So it's great to learn some um, from him um, and just have him impart his wisdom. Very quickly, um, I am a Queens, New York native. I uh, was born and raised in the borough, uh, which is one of the many reasons why I went to St. John's University uh, for their journalism program. But to explain how I got into journalism, I have to rewind to high school uh, very quickly. Story I always loved telling. My parents were very strict um, when I went to high school. They were like, you can't be someone who just goes to school and then comes back home. They said, you need to join an extracurricular activity. So I knew I liked reading and writing, um, just generally reading. And I liked watching the news with my parents. So I was like, why not join the news, um, the newspaper? It wasn't particularly a career that I saw myself pursuing at the time, but I thought it would be interesting and get a little something on my resume as I was preparing to apply to colleges. And the breakthrough for me was, funnily enough, it was a story I did about menu changes to our cafeteria. Uh, and the big thing was in freshman year, we were able to buy a big thing of French fries for a dollar. And that was just the big thing that poor high school students loved. You got big french fries and that was just what you had with whatever you brought from home and we had a salt shaker that you could just you know as much salt as you wanted just pour them onto the french fries into our sophomore year they took the salt shaker away so many people knowing that it was part of the student newspaper were like anthony find out for us like why is the salt shaker gone like why can't we put salt on our french fries anymore so i was like okay you know what like that's cool i'll do that story knocked on the president at the high school's door is like hey like, i have a story that i'm trying to do and he was happy to explain it was part of federal health guidelines. The federal government handed down some guidelines that schools had to adhere to. And part of it was no free salt because we can't have high schoolers with you know, skyrocketing blood pressure. And it was the first time that I wrote a story where I saw the appreciation of people because I was providing them with knowledge and with information that they had not previously had. And I said, wow, you know, if that was so I could do for something as silly as, you know, a salt shaker being taken away, what else could I do with this in the world? And that was the moment it clicked for me. I was like, wow, journalism's a really necessary tool um, for whatever audience you're speaking to, whether that is your school, whether that is, uh, from my experience, the fitness industry, or just a general newspaper reporter, you have a duty to educate people what's going on in their world. Um, so after high school, I went to St. John's University, uh, I majored in print journalism and I did a minor in English literature. In my senior year, I was the news editor of the, uh, the Torch, which is the student newspaper at St. John's. During that year, we had a lot of great stories. Well, not great particularly, but interesting. There was a dean who was on federal trial and sadly ended up taking her life over that trial. Um, horrible story, but it certainly kind of gave me some baptism by fire covering such a sensitive news story like that. And then there was a fallout that eventually led to the resignation of the university's president. So it was a very interesting time to be part of a student newspaper trying to 
keep track of what was going on with the university and holding them accountable while at the same time being a student. I'm sure many of you have had that kind of experience where you have to realize that you're a student and you're trying not to maybe get expelled, but you do still need to have that journalistic spirit where you're holding everyone accountable. Um, after St. John's, I worked at a chain of newspapers on the North Shore of Long Island. I was the great neck editor uh, for theislandnow.com. I then went on to the Queen's Chronicle and then I went back to Long Island where I was the Baldwin editor for the Long Island Herald. And then after that, I went to Muscle and Fitness uh, Magazine and then muscleandfitness.com. And right now I am the content coordinator for Equable Institute. And that is a nonpartisan think tank that focuses mainly on uh, pension policy reform, specifically making sure that pensions don't bankrupt certain states and cities. We try to come up with solutions for them so that they can balance giving teachers, firefighters, uh, police officers their pensions, but also not raising taxes on the state's um, you know, residents. And I write all of their stories, copy edit their reports, uh, keep an eye out for uh, pension related headlines in the news so that we can comment on them, submit op-eds uh, when necessary. So that's just a little bit of a history of my experience with, with the world of journalism. Thank you for giving us that very comprehensive. So it's a good introduction to who Anthony is and all that he's accomplished in a very short period of time. So obviously he's still a very young guy. Um, I do want to, you know, get into some of the questions that students have. I do love the story that you told about reporting for the high school paper about the French fries and the salt shaker, because I think that kind of speaks to an, a cleverness in reporting and a constant curiosity right? Mm -hmm. That like, this is something that has changed that used to be a certain way. Students obviously care about it. They were going to you and saying, hey, man, what's up with this? And, you know, I know from my uh, high school experience, French fries were a big deal at lunchtime. So uh, certainly people are going to care. Um, and that those kinds of stories, I just, you know, before I kind of get into some of the students, uh, you know, questions here, I wonder if you could speak to the fact of, you know, the, those kinds of story ideas, if you're constantly curious and you're just looking around that even on a college campus where you might think there's nothing going on, there's always something. And even now when a lot of us are obviously doing Zoom conversations instead of traditional in-person classes, you know, you may not be on campus, but still, if you just kind of look at social media accounts, if you, you know, can you think at all or, you know, share some ideas about for them reporting on a college campus, how would you find story ideas. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you kind of pointed out it's just this constant curiosity. You can't really be content with saying that like, oh, that's just the way things are or, or that's the way things have always been. It's just always questioning, well, like, why? And, you know, looking to people for the, uh, for the answers to that. The other thing really, too, is, and this is just general um, journalism advice as well, is to always get out of your own comfort zone. Um, which is to say, whether you might not find something interesting on campus, but as Nick said, if you're scouring social media accounts or if you're looking on different websites, you might see that a, a specific population of the college campus is asking questions about something. And maybe you don't personally find that interesting, but you still have, like I said, an obligation to your audience, to your readership to chase those questions out and get those answers. So for me, it was always, like I said, stop thinking the way that I think about things all the time, because I have a very specific viewpoint on everything. A lot of people do. We all have our internal um, biases and it's just um, crafted by our worldview and our environment and how we were raised, et cetera. But part of journalism is breaking out of that and making sure that you can sometimes think the way other people think because that's when you're going to find your most exciting stories. Um, I know for my college newspaper at St. John's, there was one story where the sprinklers went on during a outdoor movie night. Um, so the story was originally just going to be outdoor movie night held, but then it got turned into it was like dozens of students got soaked. So it was just like, okay, how can I make this story interesting? I found the head groundskeeper um, and I was like, how does something like this happen? So that's just one example. Instead of just writing like, hey, the sprinklers got everyone, but I was like, what happened? What was the mechanism that could lead to something like that? And it made it such a more interesting story. 
No, definitely. Um, and, you know, so some of it is just being, if you're active, if you're out there all the time, you're going, these stories kind of come to you, right? If you're, mm -hmm. you go to cover what might be a kind of traditional, not that extraordinary an event, you know, outdoor movie, and then all of a sudden the sprinklers go off. Now you've got a really fun story. And you're glad that you were there. So just take note of whenever these meetings are happening on campus, different events, and mm -hmm. make sure you don't miss them. Um, I want to see, because I have some questions here from people who, some who aren't in the chat right now, they submit in advance, others who are here. So I'm going to see if I can try to call on some of the people who do appear to be here, if they could come on. And just for all of you, if you could just introduce yourself quickly to Anthony, you know, obviously your name, your year, you know, what might interest you about journalism, just so he has a sense of what you're all about. Um, and then, you know, if you read your question, I'm also going to put the questions in chat so Anthony can see them clearly. And uh, if you don't have them, if the students don't have them pulled up, they can read them. But Kaya, I want to put your question in first because you had a question about some of what Anthony's been talking about, about St. John. So I'm putting it in the chat. Um, are you able to come on mic and talk to him? Uh, yeah, I just don't have my video right now. But um, yeah, it was related to basically what you've Oh, well, I'm Kaya. <laughs> I'm a journalism and elementary education major. Um, I'm interested in journalism. I really like the fast paced nature of the field. And I think it's really interesting. Um, so I would like to get involved in it um, in my future endeavors, however I can. Um, but uh, my question is like, what major skills like specifically working for your school newspaper do you carry over with your um with your life now that you work in the field of journalism um and then were you involved in any other clubs or organizations i know you went over this a little bit but if you could go into depth yeah absolutely great question and uh thank you for participating in your question um so we actually had an alumni panel at, for the torch uh two weeks ago and this was covered I think one of the big things that you gain from working with your student newspaper is you learn how to work with other people. You know, taking a journalism class is great and you kind of learn um, the concepts of reporting and the concepts of, of writing and et cetera. But what you gain from a student newspaper that you really can't get at in a classroom is the dynamics of a newsroom, which is to say the egos of people that are always going to be clashing. It's going to happen. You're going to have two editors who are going to disagree on how something should be phrased, a photo that should be used on the cover, and you really learn how to navigate those conversations in a peaceful manner instead of a violent manner, um, you know, instead of going to, to shouts and blows. Um, so that was something that I was really thankful to have because in your first job or, you know, in your last job, there are going to be those disagreements so it's a great way to learn for yourself how you communicate with other people, how you take criticism, how your editor, you know, when he gives you tips on how to better your story, are you going to get defensive about your writing or are you going to say like, okay, I see what you're saying. Let me take that into consideration, maybe do it a little bit differently next time. So certainly there are the dynamics of working with other people. And then there's also answering to higher authorities, which in your case would be the school administration. Uh, whatever field of journalism you go into, you're going to be dealing with people who are not happy with your stories. I mean, just look at the state of the world over the past four years. There are a lot of people who aren't necessarily happy with a lot of the news coverage that is printed or published about them. So you need to learn how to stand your ground on a story but also accept that sometimes you might get something wrong. It's gonna to happen to everybody. You're going to slip up. Um, the idea is to have it happen as little as possible and you know, just not make it too severe, but you kind of need to learn how to bounce back and maintain your credibility with those sources. And that's a great, um, joining a student newspaper is just a great way to learn how to do that. And to the extent of um, if I was involved in any other clubs, um, for some reason, every single friend that I had in college was of Caribbean descent. So I was actually a board member of our Guyanese Student Association, even though I have no Guyanese descent at all, but they had an open spot on their executive board. And because I was so involved, they asked if I would help them out. And I did. And um, I was also just a member of the um, Young Democrats Club at St. John's as well. Um, wasn't too extensively involved in that one, but I would join if there was a speaker I was particular.
Are you there? I'm sorry, my mic cut out. Yes, thank you so much. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't. And I don't know if my uh, my connection was unstable or something, but I just got an interruption in the connection. But I think we're back. I see. I think we're good, yes. Yeah. Okay. I just uh, there was a bit of an interruption there. Um, but okay. Um, so yeah, thank you for you know. And obviously, there's a lot of questions regarding your time in college. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a. I'm going to focus mostly on the questions that have been asked by the people who are here, but there's again, a few who aren't here. And I think this is a good kind of a bridge question, Anthony, because Jada asked, and again, not here right now, but she said, this is maybe going back to your time in college. Did you always know this was the career path for you? Did you always want to study journalism or be a journalist? What challenges did you face along the way? Um, and if you were not, there's a lot there. If you're not doing this, what other career do you think you'd have? But I think just more, you know, I like to always ask, like, what was the inspiration for you? Because a lot of the inspirations that journalists have, they stick with them for a very long time. It's something that, uh, you know, motivates you through all of these other issues that you might have over the mm -hmm. years. And, you know, we know that journalism is a difficult industry. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of layoffs. There's, a, you know, a lot of stuff going on. You're getting attacked by you know, the, the sources and the, the, you know, fake news and all of that. So this is stuff that sometimes you can hang on to. So did you always know this was for you? Yeah. So as I said in the beginning, um, for me, it started in high school. And from there, I had a pretty good idea that that was going to be the career path that I wanted to take. Um, I felt that it was the one that would give me the most personal fulfillment. I'm very much someone who I can't just do a nine to five and just collect the paycheck. I need to enjoy what it is that I'm doing. And I've thought about becoming a chef or a graphic designer. I had a lot of different ideas throughout the years, but when I really thought of it, it was the personal fulfillment for me that I'm doing something again, that is filling the void. I'm educating people on what's happening in the world around them. And that for me has always been what's carried me on and helped me through the challenging times when journalism seems like a very tough or the few times that I've questioned it, I would look at the difference that I've made in people's lives. Um, I would write stories about people who would get shortchanged by the city. The city would say that they would maybe do a construction job for them to improve their street and then the city backed off. I would come in, write a story, hold the city accountable, and then the necessary changes to their street would be made. Um, also working for victims of whether it be a fire or a natural disaster, again, asking the city, where are the resources for these people? And many times the government doesn't come to help people in need until a journalist like myself or Nick during his time at the Daily News, you know, comes and asks those questions. So for me, it was always, I'm doing good in the world. This is how I can contribute and make sure that people are being taken care of the way that they should be. Um, definitely like that has been what has inspired me to continue going. Um, there have definitely been many challenges. Um, when I was working in Queens um, during the 2016 election, I covered a very Republican area of Queens. Uh, if, for those of you who may not be familiar with Queens, it's generally a very um, liberal borough. It's reliably Democrat, but I covered a neighborhood called Howard Beach. Um, and as Nick probably knows, Howard Beach is definitely not Democrat. Um, it is very much pro-Trump country. It is very Republican. They go for the Republican in every presidential election. So that anti-journalism, anti-press rhetoric was definitely around when I was covering it. And I had people yelling at me because they knew I worked for the newspaper, or if I wrote a story that even somewhat criticized Donald Trump, I my inbox was flooded. Um, people would find my personal Facebook and attack me there. Um, you know, not to the point where I felt like I was in danger necessarily, but it definitely takes a toll on you mentally because you do want to feel like you're doing a good job and you're being appreciated. And when you're getting more messages of hate and disrespect than you are of encouragement, it takes a toll on you. You go to bed feeling like, why am I continuing this? But then you do have that story where it's like, wow, I'm helping somebody. I want to continue doing this. Um, and if I were not doing this, um, because of my work in muscle fitness, and I can get into a little bit of this later, I was their nutrition writer. 
and I've discovered I really like the field of nutrition. Um, I'll make this a very short story. I used to be much bigger than I am now. I've lost quite a bit of weight over the past two years, and part of that is through my nutrition. And I could see myself becoming some sort of dietitian or nutrition coach and helping people um, you know, become healthier or get to where they want to be in life. People have different ideas of what they consider you know, healthy, and I'm there to support them in whatever that, that personal journey is for them. Oh, that's great. That's a really good answer. And I, you know, it also, I think, goes to the idea that journalists end up being mini experts in lots of different fields, right? And of course, there's, that's what I always loved about journalism is that whatever anybody here is interested in as a student, if you're interested in film, you can be a movie critic. If, you know, if it's reading and a book critic, and certainly the environment, there are people who we've had who just cover climate change and politics and fashion and everything. But like you say, one that we don't talk about that much, nutrition and fitness mm -hmm. and that, you know, so, and then I guess it does prepare you for potential career and, you know, in that, if you want to go into that. So that's kind of neat. Um, yeah. yeah, we, I'm going to have this question from Jill next. There's a bunch of different students who asked about the different jobs you held at different organizations and how, uh, you know, how did you get from one to the other? What were the differences between them and trying to adapt and, and all of that? Uh, but I'm going to put Jill's question in here. And Jill, if you're around, if you're able to unmute and uh, read your question. Sure. So uh, my name is Jill and I'm a public relations major. Um, but my question was, uh, did you find it difficult when you ha held different positions at very different organizations, like assuming the writing or editing is very different between the Long Island Herald to Muscle and Fitness? Did you have any difficulties having to adjust or learn how to write for the different content? Um, yeah, there's always an adjustment period, um, even when it comes to just strict journalism. So coming from the Queens Chronicle to Long Island Herald, there is different styles. We of course had the AP style. I think Anthony's audio went out for me. Is it going out for everybody else too? Yep. Yeah. This is what happened before. To give you a grace period, um, definitely. Um, so it's just a matter of making sure, uh, for me, what I would do before I started for a new publication, what I would do is um, I would just pick up three or four of their issues, whether that's a newspaper or a magazine, and you just read through it. You just like read through it cover to cover and you kind of take note of how they approach certain things, how they reference different positions, different titles. And that's just the way that you kind of learn their style. And then just don't beat yourself up. You know, the first two weeks that you're there, if somebody corrects you and like, oh, this isn't our style. It's like, okay, you're still adjusting. Um, so it's not difficult as long as you prepare yourself again, by reading their publications, their style, and also just asking uh, just asking questions of your new editors and publishers. Thank you. And uh, we do have a few other questions that, again, that relate to that, that are from mm -hmm. folks who are here right now. So I, I do think, and as obviously we're gonna start getting into your journey at Muscle and Fitness and what exactly you covered there. And I know we want to talk about, unfortunately, the layoffs that happened there. Um, and that's a thing that a lot of our guests this semester and in the past have gone over being laid off or barely escaping layoffs. And how does that affect everybody? Um, but first, I just want to get to this question from Joanna. So Joanna, if you're around and you can unmute and I'll put this in the chat. Hi, I'm Joanna. I'm a public relations major. Um, so my question was, um, when I was looking through your LinkedIn, I noticed that you like switch jobs a lot frequently. And I actually, I phrased it a little bit weird when I was writing it, but I was wondering how your skill set had to change, like based on where you were working and what skills were like the most important. Sure. Um, so I, I just want to ask one question because I see your question here in the chat. Would you rather me more focus on um, skill set, or would you kind of recommend switching frequently? What's more important for me to touch on for you? Uh, the skills, please. The skills, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so the, the skill set um, for me personally, I feel like is 
necess necessary for any job that you hold. And that is just to be um, number one, flexible. Um, I won't get too much into it, but I did have a few um, job changes because of uh, life events. Um, certain life events just were, um, resulted in different job changes. Um, but for me, it was just being flexible. So making sure that I could go to from one job to the next. And that goes back to one of the necessary traits of journalism, which is just to have a little bit of knowledge um, in just about everything. And what I mean for that is there was a professor at St. John's that Nick knew, uh, Professor Prendergast, um, personally one of my favorite um, professors that I had there because he just taught me so much about life and journalism. And he said it's very important for journalists to know a little bit about everything. And what he meant by that is whether you stick with one job or you have multiple ones, journalists are expected to cover a lot. You can expect it to be um, at a sports game. And you, if you don't know anything about sports, you're, um, you know, you're out of luck there. So you really just kind of have to have a base knowledge of a lot of different things. And I took that to heart by making sure I was caught up on current events in New York City and on Long Island and a little bit of maybe upstate because I knew that if I wanted to move around, I just need to have an idea of what the local political scene was. So the first skill would be to just have a little base knowledge of kind of everything that's going on in the world, which is not to say to get obsessed with everything, but again, if you know what's going on with the major sports teams in your area, you could apply for a job at a sports publication because you have an idea of what's going on with the Islanders. I'll give a little shout out to Nick there. Um, you know, or, you know, since you're in Jersey, the devils or what have you, if that's, if that's your bag, it's just fine. But um, definitely just making sure that you can show potential employers, hey, I'm very knowledgeable about this. And that's what I did with muscle fitness. I said, I've been on my own personal fitness journey. So I know the terminology. I know the lingo so that my writing is not going to seem weird to your readers. Um, so I was able to just tell them like, hey, I'm, I'm ready on day one. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thank you. And thank you, Joanna, for the question. Um, I have a question next to get really firmly into muscle and fitness. Mm -hmm. I have a question here from Victoria, who I think she was here before. She might have gotten lost internet connection or something like that. So I'm just going to put it in the chat. But she was asking, as an editor, and again, if maybe you just lead us into how you got the job, Muscle and Fitness, right? however you want to take this, but what was the most challenging part of working with at Muscle and Fitness? Um, if so, how did you manage to work around those, any issues that you faced? How did you manage to stay professional yet effective? And maybe again, yeah, tell us a little bit about how did you end up, because it's obviously a brand that all of us have heard of and seen on the newsstand all the time. Uh, so how did you get the job there? And then if you could talk a little bit to Victoria's question. Yeah, so um, it's not too much of an exciting story. I was looking for um, new jobs um, because as I said, there was a few life events that necessitated, um, that made some job changes necessary. So I was looking for some new jobs and I came across the muscle and fitness one. And at that point I was on my fitness journey towards losing um, a good amount of weight. And muscle and fitness was one of the publications that I had read online looking for some nutrition and workout advice because prior to committing myself to losing weight, I had never touched a barbell before in my entire life. I had no idea how to do a bicep curl with a, uh, a dumbbell or anything like that. So I was like, I need to learn everything there is about going to the gym and eating healthy. So muscleandfitness.com was one of my go-to resources. And I wrote in my cover letter for the application, I was like, hey, I know I've got no fitness experience um, in the writing industry, but I know your brand. I know your language. I know who your audience is. I'm your audience. You know, I've been using you guys, so I know what people are looking for in your stories. This is why you should hire me. Obviously, I put a little bit more eloquently in my cover letter, but that was the gist of it. And to my surprise, I did not expect to get an interview, but I got an email asking for me to take an edit test and then an in-person interview. And by the grace of God, I was accepted. Um, 
One of the more challenging parts for me um, with working at Muscle and Fitness was definitely trying to access celebrities. So before I had been much more on the weekly newspaper scene, you know, you're dealing with your school board meetings, you're dealing with the local news matters. I wasn't trying to get in touch with Arnold Schwarzenegger's, you know, talent agency. I wasn't trying to get in touch with, um, you know, NFL teams or the WWE or what have you. So this idea of working with these huge talent agencies who represent multi-million and multi billion dollar like you know entities to me was so strange and that was the one thing that kind of tripped me up sometimes where I was just like how do I even contact somebody as as famous as um Lindsey Vaughn um or Michael Phelps Michael Phelps was one of um, my earlier interviews and I was just like how does one find Michael Phelps's press contact I know how to contact a government agency because there are numbers all over the internet those are easy but you know, to find the contact information for an Olympic swimmer, that to me was difficult. But luckily, my coworkers were very willing to train me in, here's who you go to for this, here's who you go to for that. Um, but it did take some, some learning. And um, even to the point where I, I had left Muscle Fitness and late last year, there were still some people where I was just like, I have no idea. It was just like, do I Twitter DM them? Do I reach out on Instagram? Like, and sometimes that's how I had to do it. I would just comment on Instagram and I would just be like, hey, I want to interview you. And they would get back to me that way sometimes. I love that you told that story because I think that um, that's something that you just learn as a journalist is how to get in touch with people um, and how do you track down folks. Um, I don't know if you've ever used this website, but I was just showing it to my students. I only found out about it a few months ago. That's them.com, which is a website where you can mm -hmm. essentially look up. It's a little bit scary, uh, but you can basically put in anybody's, uh, you know, first name, last name and find address and phone numbers and potential contacts and all that. So very useful for a journalist. Um, but yes, how to get in touch with press people to get that interview with someone really famous, the publicist and all that. I often just would Google around publicist, Arnold Schwarzenegger, spokesman, mm -hmm. spokesperson until I got somebody and usually you find it. Um, but that's a really neat one. I just want to, mm -hmm. I'm going to go through a few other questions that my students have asked here. I just want to let all the students who are here, if you did not submit a question in advance, of course, I still want to hear from you. So just let me know, just send me a message in the chat that you'd like to speak or raise your hand and I'll make sure that we get you here to, to ask something of Anthony. I do want to make sure everybody has a chance during the time that we'll have. Um, as we kind of uh, move on here then, and I'm just admitting people in the waiting room at the same time. Um, so I'm gonna try to go to Evan's question next, um, going a little bit into the, you know, the future, but also I think, uh, you know, kind of, you'll see what, where he's going here. Um, but Evan, if you're around, could you come uh, off, you know, off mute and uh, introduce yourself and uh, read your question? Hi, uh, my name's Evan Schiebler. I'm a broadcast journalism major. And then my uh, question was about the, um, how has the progression of your career helped you grow in the communications field? And, you know, like, as you grow, what are your hopes for your future? Because I know it's an ever-changing industry. And, you know, especially nowadays, it's not common to like sit still for long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, can you just repeat the first the first part of the question again? Uh, like how has the progression, like how you have progressed in your career, how has that helped you grow as a journalist? Yeah, um, great question. So I think throughout my career, I've definitely, well, number one, I think my writing every year, you know, I think sometimes when I look back on my writing from a year ago, I'm like, wow, what? was I thinking when I crafted that lead or I crafted that paragraph, you, you just become such a better writer every year, um, or at least I think you should be. Um, as, as you progress through your career, you should really be looking back. Um, sometimes I cringe when I look at my old torch articles from St. John's, I'm just like, oh my God, how did I even think I could become a journalist writing like this? Which is not a knock on me back then because you're supposed to be learning. Um, you're supposed to be, 
you know, finding ways to fine tune yourself. I think that's one of the ways I've definitely um, progressed the most is definitely in my writing. My writing has become a little bit more sophisticated. I've learned new ways, um, definitely found my style. It sometimes take people a while to learn what their style is. Everyone has their own individual, you know, trademark, so to speak. Um, and I think it's only maybe been in the last three, four years where I'm just like, okay, this is me. Um, in the beginning, maybe you're trying out a few different things at once, and maybe it was a result of changing jobs so frequently. I had to learn different styles for one publication and then the next, and it didn't give me enough time um, to really create, like, like I said, my own my own personal brand. And now I've, I've certainly got that. Um, I think that's definitely number one. Number two, also, I definitely think um, I've become a more patient person. Going back to what I said before, you know, journalists were bombarded by sources, were bombarded by our editors, um, your coworkers, and it can be a lot at times. You know, you can be overwhelmed because, especially in the weekly newspaper industry, I was writing. 20 items, I say items because it could range from a blurb to a full feature story, 700 plus words. So 20 items per week um, and just balancing all the demands of, you know, this source has a tip for me. And then the publisher says, hey, we have an advertiser who wants an advertorial done. Um, you, you can get overwhelmed sometimes from all the demands, but just being in the industry for this long, I've found ways to put things in different buckets and just make sure that nothing spills over and overwhelms me at one time. And my plans for the future, I definitely see myself kind of staying in the, um, the fitness writing industry. I still do some freelance pieces for a website called barbenda.com. Um, again, still writing for their nutrition vertical. And I'm trying to I'm not trying to, I'm um, staying in that field because I do think that that is something that I'm very passionate um, writing about. And I want to continue doing because the, and this is a whole nother conversation, but influencer culture, people who try to preach apple cider vinegar as the cure for obesity, it just, it ticks me off. Like I said, as someone who's been there and I want to be one of the voices of reason who said like, no, like this is how you take care of yourself. It's not with Kim Kardashian slim tea. It's, you know, eating healthy food, whole foods. So my plan for the future is definitely to stay in the fitness industry. Like I said, as that voice of sanity. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and thank you again, Evan, for the question. Um, so I'm going to ask this question from Riley. And so just to give Riley a second to prepare here uh, and then open it up. I mean, I have lots of questions that I can ask Anthony uh, who seems to be frozen right now, but hopefully he'll be able to reach okay. um, But I, I'll uh, also again, open up to all of you. If you wanna just raise your hand or DM me or something, um, then maybe we can uh, get you guys in here. We certainly will have some time to do that. Um, but Riley, if you're able to unmute and then I'll post your question in the chat because you kind of are focusing on the pandemic and how that has affected journalists and maybe Anthony in particular. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I'm Riley, I'm a, I'm a journalism major. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, is it, has it been made harder to write for a fitness magazine like during a pandemic? Like, is it hard to like try and write things about fitness when like people can't go to the gym in some situations? Yeah, um, it was definitely hard in the first two weeks because I think none of us had any idea what was going on. This whole pandemic thing was well new to the entire world, but the idea of gyms being closed was new to the fitness industry. There was no um, event that had ever closed down gyms around the world, certainly maybe different pockets due to natural disasters or what have you, but the entire world's gyms being shut down at once was definitely jarring. So there was maybe I would say a three week period where our content was lagging a little bit because usually we would rely on, oh, hey, here's an Instagram video of a power lifter, you know, deadlifting a thousand pounds and we could count on 
one of those videos at least every week because people always want to put their crazy lifts on Instagram. But when you have no gyms, it definitely created a lull. But then it goes back to, you know, even though I wasn't what some people might call a journalist, as Nick said in the beginning, you still have those journalistic skills and traits of, well, I'm curious about this and critical thinking. So it was, what are the best shelf stable foods? So again, as a nutrition writer, I was like, what can people stock in their homes since we're going to be stuck in our homes for, you know, God knows how long, supposedly only two weeks, but still going on two weeks now. Um, and so it, it all just had to go back to, you know, like, how do you find a story where there appears to be no story? Um, so again, it was like, how do you work out from home? How do you work out? I live in 300 square feet for my, with my girlfriend and our cat. Um, so it was, you know, how do you work in a shoe box size New York City apartment? How do you work out on the beach with no equipment? How do you work out in any situation? So we were able to restart up our usual cadence of content, but it was definitely a challenge in the first two weeks. And I think part of that was also we were, um, as people, just adjusting to life in quarantine and um, and working remotely. And what I would say um, about what I've learned from my job um, over the past year is, I guess it was kind of like the same thing. There's always a story out there, even um, when it seems like the world is shut down and nothing is happening. You just, again, have to go out and look for it. And I'm still you know, using that when it comes to the job that I have now, when it comes to pension policy reforms. When news might seem light and there's nothing going on, it's just a matter of digging into different resources and finding what other people aren't talking about. So I think the pandemic has definitely made me more um, passionate about finding stories where there appears to be none. Well, thank you. Um, and I think people are relying on you even more at this point, right? Because a lot of people who are so used to going to the gym now during the pandemic, they're trying to figure out. And of course you were talking, I loved what you were saying before about kind of the mission of the journalist to inform and maybe to lead people away from that idea of there's, uh, you know, these people trying to take advantage of a situation, snake oil salesmen who are maybe mm -hmm. saying, this is the exercise equipment you should buy so you can use it at home. We see all those infomercials, but you just have to tie this to the doorknob or to the top of the door frame and you can stretch and it was just as good as everything else you can get. Um, and then also, you know, as you were talking about, like, you know, oh, just this is the cure-all to drink, what was it, the cider vinegar or whatever it is, yeah. you know, that's going to be the thing that um, that helped you and so that you can come in there as the expert and kind of tell people we needed it so much during the pandemic. Um, yeah. No, so uh, yeah, no, terrific. Um, I, I do want to just, you know, I'll have some questions that I can certainly ask Anthony um, following up. I'm endlessly curious, so I have lots of stuff I can talk to him about, but I do want to just see, is there anybody else who hasn't had a chance to get a question in yet? Or if you did already get a question, but you'd like a second question in, because I think I've gotten through most of the people in my class who are currently here who submitted questions. Um, but just for the other folks there, I know John, Chris, Isabel, um, is there anybody else who would like to, uh, Liz Mary, sorry, just seeing everybody else who's here. Uh, would any of you like to ask a question? Just let me know. Just click the raise hand and I'll see it. I do have a question. Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Christopher. I'm a senior major in journalism. Um, you talked about earlier about when you were applying to your job, um, despite having no uh, uh, experience or knowledge about fitness. Um, and that, you know, with the help of your cover, you were able to get an interview. Um, would you say that would be the best approach in, in, in getting a job and not, and not have that kind of experience? Um, no, also, sorry, now I have my, my cat joining me as a guest, so <laughs> apologies for that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's the best, but uh, my father, one of the best pieces of advice my, my dad gave me early on was um, sometimes, not all the times, but sometimes it's not um, you know, kind of what you know is who you know. So definitely, you know, I think journalism is one of those industries where you can't burn bridges, whether that's sources or old college professors, classmates, what have you. 
you need to make sure that you have a network of people um, who can help you in any situation. You know, I have friends and classmates right now who are experts in all sorts of fields. So I would say, you know, stay in contact with them because they can help you if you have a question on anything, or they can help you if you have a potential interview with a certain publication and you need advice. Hey, how do I approach this? How do I talk about this subject matter? Um, but I, I think that's definitely an important thing to keep in mind as you progress throughout your career. Just make sure that you still have certain connections because they can help you in ways that you you don't really know right now, but will become apparent to you in the next few years. Thank you. Yeah, and and thanks for the uh, the question, Chris. I you know yeah you know it's interesting to me because I feel that. Um, well, a few things that I want to mention there. When you were talking before about Mark Prendergast, who was a professor at St. John's University that both of us were familiar with. Um, he taught Anthony, he was a colleague of mine when I was an adjunct there before I went on to go to William Patterson. And he had worked for a long time at the New York Times. I just want to mention something there uh, because when Anthony said it before, it triggered a thought. One of Mark's things was coming up with endless story ideas and he said, you know, he was in Marillac Hall, one of the classroom buildings on campus, and he noticed, and all of you could write this story at William Paris, I don't know if anyone's ever done it, but this idea of like, even on the dreariest day with nothing happening, how you could find a story. And he was saying that a bunch of people were waiting at the elevator and the button was already lit up to go up. And yet someone else came up and even though they see the person there who probably pushed that button to light it up, they too push the button <laughs> and it's that something that we all do all the time it's like we have to be the one to do it you already know it's happening but you push just to make sure that sort of thing and it's a little thing that might not on its surface seem like oh this is going to be the most exciting story but the point being that everyday things that are happening all around you whatever time you're on campus whenever it is if it's the summer break the winter there's not a lot of people there's stuff to be written so I just want to get that out because you mentioned that, um, you know, about Mark before. Uh, and then, you, you know, the second point that you're making about it's not what you know, but who you know. I often talk to students about, and I even say this as a professor, right? So I'm just kind of, I guess, going against my own case here. But I was going to say that no one really asked you, I don't know if this ever happened to you, Anthony, but no one really ever asked me about my GPA, except for when I was applying for graduate mm -hmm. school. So yes, if maybe if your goal is you want to get a master's or a PhD, the route that I took, then yeah, you might want to be concerned about your GPA because other academics are going to be looking and that's the sort of thing they care about. So that's not to say that you should just, you know, throw away GPA and do terrible <laughs> in all your classes and go off, but it is to say that what's more important, I think, is developing a positive relationship with your professors because as Anthony was kind of intimating, they're the ones who know how to get internships, get jobs, I get contacted every now and then. I just got contacted the other day by someone who said, oh, you know, there's some jobs at Univision. They're hiring a New York Giants person. Mm -hmm. and they want someone who's bilingual. Do you know any students who might be interested in covering this? And so if I've had a good student in class, I'll think of you. If you kind of slacked off and weren't the best, I'm not going to really send that job your way. Mm -hmm. So it's that sort of a, you know, the reasoning. And, and my first job at the Daily News came because a professor at St. John's had had me in class liked my work, an editor from the Daily News contacted her and said, hey, do you know any good you know, young people who could be interns? And that's how I got in. Um, so I just, I want to reinforce that point. It's really important yeah. um, for sure. Um, and even though I know I was very shy, you know, in school and, and going through that process, it can be tough to like network and meet <laughs> people and all that, but you gotta kind of get over that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I want just to get, give another chance to see if there's anybody else in the room who wants to ask a question. If I don't see any raised hands, I'm gonna to go to some of the other questions that some students had asked in advance. Um, they, again, students who might not be here currently, but did have some questions for you. Um, so again, anyone raise your hand if you wanna get in next, but for now, I'm just gonna to go to this question that Joe had sent in advance and I'll put it, uh, it may not be perfectly edited here, but I'll put it in the chat so everyone can see it. Um, so he's saying here that he was looking at your LinkedIn and you've already talked a little bit about this, uh, but you know, worked in different organizations, you built up your experience so much, um, 
but was it difficult to jump around constantly from company to company? Was it easy to transition? I know you've discussed a little bit about that and the different styles mm -hmm. of writing or editing between the Long Island Herald and the Queen's Chronicle and Muscle and Fitness and Echo Bowl, I guess, where you're at now. Um, and do you uh, believe by working for many companies, it helped you become prepared for future projects and collaborate with other writers and companies? Anything you'd like to say there, Anthony? Sorry, it's a little bit jumbled yeah. there. It was when I was formatting it from the file, it got a little bit messed up there. So it looks like another language, but it's English. No, no worries. Um, I think definitely, so it kind of goes back to the same question. You know, the more you work with people, the more that you learn about a lot. Um, and I mean, I think one of the best writing instructors I had, strangely enough, is was at Muscle and Fitness, which sounds strange because they're like, oh, Muscle and Fitness is a bunch of meatheads telling me how to work out. Um, but my editor um, at Muscle and Fitness, he was able to communicate to me in a way that no other editor had before, just how to approach feature writing. Because obviously with a magazine, feature writing is much more prevalent than um, maybe a lot of newspapers are. And I was always more, I was always better at straight news stories than I was at feature writing. Um, I would not say that feature writing was my strong suit before I went into muscle and fitness. Um, but he was able to just communicate with me, it, to me rather, in a way that, like I said, no other one was able to do, just how to illustrate certain quotes or how to use quotes even, when to use quotes or when to rather just describe something, how to describe something. Um, my feature writing has just gotten exponentially better ever since um, I worked at Muslim Fitness and I'm grateful to my editor, um, Zach, um, who was a great guy as well. Um, so yeah, I think just working for these different companies has definitely prepared me for different projects because I've had so many teachers. I've had so many, and, and that's what editors really are a lot of times. There are teachers still even though you're not uh, in school anymore, you still have people who are trying to teach you how to do things certain ways. So it's important, like I said in the beginning, how do you take those people's criticisms? You know, are you going to, you know, buckle down and get defensive about it? Or are you going to say, hey, this person has been working in this industry, sometimes as long as I've been alive, I have something that I can learn from them. Um, so I think that's definitely been one of the positives of working for so many companies is I've had so many different minds, people who take different approaches to things. Yeah, and a few points I know that we had talked in advance, Anthony, we want to make sure that we hit on, but you just mm -hmm. hit on one that I just want to reiterate. It's difficult because since so many of the veteran journalists have now left journalism, and, you know, unfortunately, again, layoffs and newspapers with long histories have closed or mm -hmm. had to lay off a lot of these people who had such talent and would normally be the people who take a young person like Anthony under their wing and say, you know, okay, here's what you do in this situation and be a mentor. There's less opportunity for that. And I worry that with a lot of the mobile journalism and the go, 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 rush, 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 that there's not the kind of chance, just like you're just a rat race every day. You're just mm -hmm. relieved that it's the end of the day and you get to go home and rest. And so there's not that kind of, especially now during the pandemic, right? There's not the opportunity to have a quick conversation in a hallway and you know get to know people maybe the way that you could as much pre-pandemic. Um, but if you do find yourself, as Anthony said, at a place where there is someone who is willing to teach you and you know call you aside, please take advantage of that. Don't look at it as, someone, you know, maybe again, we can be sensitive about our writing and if someone critiques it or says something, you know, they're trying to help, they're trying, and they're not paid to do this. This is just kind of, they want to help others. Journalists, I think naturally are inclined to do that and help young journalists. Someone did it for them years ago, they're paying it forward. Um, so if you could find that mentor, you know, that would be yeah. terrific. Um, I do want just, you know, a few again, points that Anthony and I talked about in advance that we want to make sure we get into. So. You know, you mentioned, Anthony, when we were talking before that you're only one of five people who survived a series of layoffs at Muscle and Fitness. I told you we've had multiple guests come as part of this guest lecture series over the last several years who have themselves been laid off or experienced extensive buyouts and layoffs. And it can demoralize a newsroom. It can lead them to second guessing the career that they're in. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, and 
as you had pointed out when we were talking about it, it's a topic many in journalism and communications have had to deal with, something I'm sure that some students are concerned with, like, you know, should I pursue a journalism career or am I just gonna get laid off? You know, all these places are not keeping people around. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that experience. Um, how do you keep up morale? And how do you kind of keep working when there's that ever-present fear of, you know, I could get a phone call to go to the editor's office and I could be next? Yeah, I mean, it was really scary. Um, I'll make this a quick story. So uh, Muscle and Fitness in February of uh, 2020, so shortly before the world shut down, was purchased by a new owner. Um, it was previously um, with American Media, um, which was David Pecker, who was in a uh, few headlines because of his interactions with our last president. Um, so he sold off Muscle and Fitness and we had gotten an email saying, you, we all have a meeting with the executive vice president at 10 o'clock in the morning. And there's only two reasons why you ever have a meeting with the executive vice president of a uh, publishing company, which is either one, somebody important has died or two, a couple of pink slips are going out. And that happened, it, you know, was the case that there was a lot of pink slips going out because of the, the buyout of the publication. They kept five employees out of nearly 50, I think, you know, we had um, designers, we had photographers, we had advertising agents. And the reason why they kept me and the four other people was because of our experience in digital media. Yeah, we had our experience with the print product, the magazine, and I obviously had experience in print journalism before, but I also knew how to keep up a website. I knew how to, um, maintain social media, how to keep track of Google Analytics and things like that. So the reason why I mentioned to Nick, you know, that I want to talk about the, the layoffs is just one of the biggest pieces of advice that I would give to anyone considering this as a career is diversify your skill set as much as possible. You know, being a good reporter and a good writer is obviously core to what you're going to do if you want to get into journalism, but to remain competitive as a potential employee, you unfortunately need to know so much more, which is how do you maintain a CMS? How do you maintain, some people even teach themselves coding because it can be such an asset to their company and they remain an attractive um, employee to potential you know, employers. Um, in terms of morale, it was unfortunate because ours was on a Friday. Um, when everyone got laid off. So I had all weekend to just think about like, wow, like all my friends, all my coworkers, I'm not gonna be there on Monday when I show up. Um, what I personally did with the few people who were spared the layoffs, we got into a room that had a giant whiteboard and we said, okay, like we're thankful that we have jobs. This is a pretty sucky situation. Number one, what's our new workflow going to look like? Because again, we went from having a staff of like, 45 to 50 people to five people. Who are we going to answer to? Who's going to be the editor in chief? What does our workflow look like? Um, so really, you know, in terms of keeping up morale, it's just making sure you know how your job is going to be done and just finding a way to, to continue. It's an unfortunate, you know, circumstance that it happened, but we all said like, you know what, like we need to make sure that we, um, look good for our new our new boss, the person who had purchased the company. We want to make sure that we impress them. So that was like number one. It was just like, okay, like what do we do? And also, how do we make sure that this doesn't happen again? How do we keep up readership to the point where this is a profitable company that we can say like, hey, like not only should you not lay off more of us, but we need more help because we're growing at such a big. Um, at such a big rate. We wanted to just make sure that we could get the website to be as big as possible and as successful as possible. It's, I thank you for being willing to share it. It's obviously a very difficult thing to talk about. No one likes to lose colleagues and have to go through that situation, but a bunch of journalists, again, have been willing to discuss it. And I think it's important because 
it prepares people in the future for that possibility. It shows that it's not really anything that you've done wrong as a journalist. Mm -hmm. If it happens to you or a colleague, right? It's just that unfortunately the economics of the business and how things are going, sometimes that happens. And it's not just in journalism, right? It's in every field. Um, but it's good to know, learn a little bit about coping mechanisms and strategies that students can use, uh, you know, going forward. So, you know, in something more positive, uh, you know, we had also talked before the event about you occasionally still contribute to muscle and fitness, but your full time mm -hmm. title now is content coordinated Equable Institute. It's a bipartisan nonprofit that educates and informs employees, retirees, policymakers, and taxpayers about how to create real retirement plans, sustainability and accountability without sacrificing future income security. That's what it says on the website. <laughs> um, so reading the little commercial there. Uh, but as we've been describing, I think that for all of these folks, some of them may not be journalism majors. They're mostly here are communication majors. Mm -hmm. They're taking a journalism class, but maybe just as part of a program in public relations or something else. Uh, I often encourage them think about journalism at least as a minor. I think it mm -hmm. shows that you are, you know, really serious about what you're doing and, um, you know, that you can critically think and you can, again, develop the writing skills. You're going to have to write in whatever job you're in. You're going to have to write a memo or emails. And coming up with a headline is similar to coming up with a subject line in an email these days or a tweet. How do you condense all that information? Well, that's like what you learn how to write a lead. Um, in, you know, in a news writing class, 25, 35 words, is that any real different than summarizing stuff in a tweet or any other social media post or email? So can you talk a little bit about how, I know, you, again, you've done a little bit of this, but, you know, a little, for a lot of the folks here who are public relations, other majors, how does that relate to other jobs, maybe? Yeah, um, so I think one of the biggest ways that journalism for me has um, you know, still been core to what I do, even though I'm no longer in journalism per se, is um, journalists have to learn how to convey sometimes very complicated topics to everybody. Um, you need to know how to explain whether it is a government's budget or some new medical breakthrough and again, if you're in communications, if you're a PR person, you're, you need to find a way that anyone on the street, your grandmother, you know, a stranger can understand what you're saying. I feel like a lot of times other fields outside of journalism, they stay stuck in their, their own language. They stay stuck in their own lingo. And if you hand that off to somebody else, they're just like, well, what does this mean? Yeah, if I'm writing about pensions and I say something like, oh, wow, your state has a lot of um, unfunded liabilities or you're not, you know, remaining to um, paying the actuarially recommended, um, you know, pension um, payment, a lot of people might be like, what does that mean? Like, what, what's an unfunded liability? What's, what's an actuarially recommended, you know, so-and-so? Um, journalists have this really unique skill, like I said, you know, whether it's a medical study. So with muscle and fitness, I took a lot of science journals and a big part of my job was translating that again into just plain English. What does this mean for the everyday, you know, person? And I feel like that is something that you definitely learn in journalism. You just have to, you know, say like, keep it simple. You know, just don't make it overly complicated. Don't use too much lingo. That is something that was taught to me a lot and my journalism classes are just like, you know, deliver to people straight. Um, you kind of have to assume that people are learning about a subject for the first time when they're reading your work. And obviously that um, is not true all the time because you have very specialized publications, um, especially when it comes to things like finances um, or science. But for the vast majority, you're going to be writing for publications that reach a very broad audience. So you need to understand how to, again, take one thing and then just make it applicable to something that everyone can read. No, definitely. Um, again, the, the ability to condense, analyze, synthesize information, I think is so critical. Um, and the fact that you learn that in every journalism course that you take, coming up with ideas, the creativity, 
all of that is so useful. And just as another kind of a addendum to that, everybody uses news, right? I mean, throughout your career, you are going to be looking at news stories and you're going to be kind of, uh, you know, learning about uh, what, you know, how do you differentiate between watching different cable news channels and is this opinion or fact or mm. reading different articles what should i invest my time in should i buy muscle and fitness or should i just trust the guy uh, the quack on tv who's telling me to drink vinegar or whatever it is um all of that is just media literacy that i think you become well aware i've had students in the past tell me this even if they're not going to become journalists they now pay attention to things that they wouldn't have in the past and maybe then it prepares you for an event like the pandemic where all of a sudden now we all are looking to journalists to give us news in a way that even people who used to say like, I don't really pay attention to news. It's like, well, really? Now you, you're gonna pay attention, right? Because <laughs> lockdowns, vaccines, treatments, that's all being reported, you know, uh, you, you care. Um, so I think that that's, that's critical. Um, I want just again, see, is there, is there anyone here who has questions that you'd like to get to? I know we're gonna start wrapping up before too long and see if there's any final advice that Anthony has, but I want to make sure I'm getting to everybody. I think we're mostly, yep. mostly good yep. there then. Um, so then, yeah, so Anthony, again, as we wrap up, and I'm sorry, we've taken, you know, taking you a, a, for a while here. Um, yep. You've been here for about, uh, you know, an hour and also uh, I should note your great shirt, <laughs> The World Needs Journalists. That's nice that yes. you wore that for us today, <laughs> um, which is really an important uh, belief. And you know, I think it's very important, especially now, even when I was teaching at St. John's, certainly when I was going to St. John's myself as a journalism student, we were not under this kind of attack. There was not this kind of ever present fear of something happening to journalists. There were still feelings that you know you could be, yeah, there'd be times you might get attacked. There might be like, you know, a few people write nasty letters to the editor. Politicians don't like what you wrote about them. Sure, that stuff I think was always a part of journalism. But the way that it has become now, where, you know, like you said, you write a story about Donald Trump and people in Howard Beach or wherever get really upset about it. I guess people now around the world can see your story, right? So it's not even just people who live in Queens. It's mm -hmm. limitless and taunt you on social media. You know, when I started as a reporter, we didn't really even have social media accounts. So the first few years of the Daily News, I didn't even have a Twitter account. So there's no way to even find me if you thought that my story was terrible and you want to criticize something I was doing. Now it's become a lot more, you know, a little scary there. Um, and you've, you've spoken to, to that. Um, but yeah, just as we, you know, as we wrap up and we thank you so much for taking this time out of a busy schedule to do this, any words of wisdom, kind of final thoughts? You've given a lot of advice that you sprinkled throughout this so far, but as these students are going forth into the world, an uncertain world of journalism, some of them are graduating in less than a month or so, um, what would you say to them about why journalism is important and you know, why they should still believe? Yeah, um, Nick, you know, kind of uh, summarized it really well. And it was just, um, I, I, you may not think that you rely on the news so much, but we do, you know, um, you know, I worked with, or I wrote for a lot of um, meatheads for muscle and fitness. And these are people who may not think that they rely on news, but muscle and fitness magazine, even if it's here's how to properly squat, that's a version of the news. It's a version of like, Hey, you, there's a lot of mistruths out there let me tell you how to do it properly and let me tell you why you should listen to me a because you might get injured b because you know you're leaving gains on the table you know you might not gain muscle as quickly as possible if you're um you know doing it incorrectly news is very you know central to a lot of things that we do in life even if it's not a newspaper per se news has taken various different forms um and as we mentioned before, that can be someone who writes about movies. There's news about movies. There's news about the climate. Um, we need critical thinkers, I think is the best way to put it. You know, critical journalists are critical thinkers because we need critical thinkers to question, hey, is this the best way that we can be operating right now? Can it be done better? And then they're the ones who show us like, yes, it can be done better. 
and here's why. And they know how to reach the experts in different fields. Maybe if they're not an expert themselves, they know, hey, I know somebody who, do, who does know what they're talking about. Um, so whether you're a communications person, you're a public relations person, um, you know, it's very important to just stay curious. Um, I think that can be applicable in any job. Stay curious, you know, like what's different out there? What should my readers, what should my audience um, know about that they don't know right now? Also, like I said, maintain your contacts. If you have a friend right now who is a major in microbiology, you never know if you're going to be working on a story or working on a press release that has to deal with cell function and how you know cells react to a vaccine per se so if you maintain that friendship and you maintain you know at least that close connection you'll always have a source or you'll have someone who can explain complicated topics to you and then also just remain remain committed because you are providing a very valuable resource um, whether it feels like that every day you know is going to be a different question there are going to be those challenges but just know that you are making a, a difference in the world. And, you know, as uh, the Washington Post says, you know, democracy dies in darkness. You know, without, without these critical thinkers, I, I shudder to think what our world would look like today. You know, we see different civilizations and societies throughout the world that don't have journalism. You know, the idea of thinking critically is it's illegal in many places and you look at that and it might look idyllic at, at first, but it, it's very scary to be in a, in a place like that. So again, whether you're a journalist or you're writing press releases or what have you, I think these are core qualities that everyone can take and apply to, to their profession. Thank you very much, you know, very well said. I also, just as a you know, final note there, I would say, you know, we tend to focus a lot on New York Times, Washington Post, those sorts of uh, outlets, but look at where Anthony has worked. You can make a key contribution, and I think sometimes more of a contribution, by working for a community news outlet, you know, like he was on Long Island or in Queens, and certainly at, I don't want to call them a niche magazine, because that maybe connotes that they're lesser than, but I just mean, uh, you know, a certain cultural industry magazine like A Muscle and Fitness, um, where you're really changing people's lives, right? I mean, like Anthony talking about his own journey and how many people right now are scared about their own nutrition, want to lose weight, want to get into better shape, their doctors warn them about something and they're turning to what Anthony had written, you know, and maybe even years later, they're going to find something that he wrote after he's long gone and they're going to use that to, you know, make better informed decisions in their own lives immediately. What a great impact that makes. Um, so, you know, thank you so much again, Anthony, for taking all this time to share it with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And yeah, we, we just uh, are grateful for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. And good luck to everybody. And uh, Nick, thank you so much for having me. Sure, of course. Um, well, th thank again, thanks everyone who's here. Just as a, f a note for all of you, uh, we're going to have a few more guest speakers towards the end of the month, April 27th. We're going to have a former colleague of mine from the New York Daily News, Will Cruz. He is now an executive editor at ABC News. Um, and he's also uh, involved in National Association of Hispanic Journalists. So if any of you are interested in that, that's April 27th at 6 p.m. The next day, April 28th, I think it's again at 6 p.m., we're going to have an event with NLGJA. That is the lesbian uh, national, I forget they're now, they, they've changed their, their official name, but national lesbian gay, um, you know, alliance. And we're going to have an event with one of their journalists, Derek Clifton, who has written for ABC, uh, NBC News and Vice. And then the following day, April 29th, we're going to have a trivia night, some fun-filled trivia and some maybe giveaways we're going to be doing. We're still figuring out some of those details, but there's going to be a kind of WPSBJ week to close out April. So if any of you are interested in that, just look out in your emails, social media accounts uh, for WPSBJ. We'll be tweeting and Instagram about that. All right. But otherwise, thank you everyone for attending. I appreciate it. Have a good night. Good night, everybody.